The reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Jesus announces the good news. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him for the word of the Lord. You know, I love the fact that we've got people in this church that can do talented things with children because they're much more talented at it than I am. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, um, one of the announcements that I didn't make is that I'm actually going on leave. Our family is heading on a, on a bit of a break over the next two weeks. And uh, Bev is going to be officiating and looking after us next week. Thank you, Bev. And, and then the following week, we've got Ian Savage coming back to St. Paul's. Ian spent some time here many years ago. I think he was doing his curacy. That's a long time ago, isn't it? And uh, he's coming back to St. Paul's, so we're going to really look forward to seeing Ian. And then I'll be back the following week. Well, come and follow. Come and follow. That's today's theme. And uh, follow is an interesting word. I like that, that uh, follow. It actually sort of demonstrates, doesn't it, that one thing following another. And uh, if you think about that word, you know, it's got the implication that there's something or someone that you pursue, that you go after, uh, that they're, they're leading you somewhere in a particular direction somewhere. That's the connotation. But that something or someone, it doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be a real person or anything. It can be just something. For instance, when I was a kid... Um, I wanted to be, well, my favourite movie as a child or young man was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Anyone seen that? Now, I, there's a particular character in that show who I thought was pretty neat, and that's Indiana Jones. And as a young boy of about 12, I don't know how old I was, I was pretty young, I thought, gee, I'd really like to be, I'd like to be like Indiana Jones. You know, he's brave, he's smart. He's an archaeologist. That's pretty smart. It's got ologist in it, right? And he's a university lecturer. But not only that, he goes and does all these great adventures and he, um, he, he goes and shoots guns and he knows how to fight and he's handsome and rugged and I really thought he's scared of snakes. That's the only thing. But I thought, gee, that's, that's someone I'd like to be. He knows how to outsmart the opposition and I thought, oh, I'd really, yeah, maybe I should grow up and be an archaeologist. And then I found out what archaeologists do and discovered that everything that Indiana Jones does is only in the movies. So I never really went into archaeology at all. But we do follow things, don't we? We, we have aspirations to be like other people. Um, we've got mentors. We've got people that we aspire to have the same traits or the same characteristics because these people make a strong impression on us and they, they give us an example of something we'd like to follow. Um, the other thing that we, we have to think about when it comes to following is the various influences on our lives that help us to think about 
where we want to go and what we want to be like. For instance, our local identity and sense of belonging, that plays a part in how we follow. Um, We often think about stories of sons who want to grow up and be like their dad or do the same career as their dad or daughters that grow up and want to do the same thing as their mum or switch it around. Daughters that want to do things their dads does and so forth. So local identity, family, sense of belonging. Sporting teams, you think about this. I follow St Kilda, the best, the best football team in the world. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Why don't you all follow St Kilda? The reason I do is because my grandfather followed St Kilda, of course. You know? Is that, um, I, I'm a Christian primarily because I grew up in a Christian household. And I became a Christian that way. Is that a good enough reason? Well, I don't know. But as time went on, I got to know the Lord in a deep way because of the family influence. Teachers have a powerful influence over children in determining what they follow. So you teachers out there, you hold the very futures of children in the palm of your hand, their young minds. We often follow because of peer pressure what our colleagues are doing, what our friends are doing. We follow into all different directions and different places. And invariably, whether we know it consciously or subconsciously, we are following something. And you could call the something that we follow, potentially, it could be called an idol. Potentially, it could be called an idol. So today, as we open up the Scriptures... And tease out this idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, it's worth considering this question at the very start. What are the influences that are competing for my time? What are the influences that are competing for my energy, my creativity, my priorities? Let me pray. Loving Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Today's reading comes in two parts. Jesus proclaims his first message and then that's followed up by the calling of his first disciples. And I think as we go through, you'll notice that these two parts work intrinsically together with one another. Let's pick it up. At Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It says this, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It's important for us to put this in its context. This is the first chapter of Mark. And in this chapter, we have started with this image of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus and preaching a message of repentance and of baptism. And of course, Jesus comes along with a very similar message, a message of repentance. Then there's a brief description of Jesus being baptised. And after his baptism, it's really interesting that he's led by the Holy Spirit into a time of testing and temptation for 40 days and then after that Jesus comes out and basically preaches his first sermon albeit very short the time has come the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe in the good news now that message is the foundational message of the gospel This is the message that Jesus continuously proclaims throughout the whole gospel. And he doesn't just proclaim it with his mouth, but he proclaims it with demonstrations of power. We see demonstrations of power through healing, through deliverance. We see Jesus having authority over the elements, the wind and the rain, as we go right through this particular gospel. The time has come, he says. The fulfilment of time is important here because it reminds us that time is in God's keeping. 
There's a time for Jesus. This is the appointed time for Jesus to inaugurate his ministry. And that's what's happening here. But there's a time for you and a time for me as well. We are also called to a ministry of sorts, whether it be a formal ministry or an informal ministry. And there's a time that will come when we need to give an account for our lives before God. We don't know when this will happen, but there will be a time where our life ends. The time has come. It is a fulfilment of the past and the birthing of something new. Jesus has come to the conclusion here that it's time for his public ministry to start. And he begins with that message. The good news is that there is a new king, a kingdom, a new king, a reign of God in the world because God is now present among his people in the world. God has come near and the reign of God, the kingdom of God, has come near. You know, we often look at the world and we think about all the terrible things that are happening, but this is a scripture that reminds us that actually God reigns and God rules over all things that are happening in our lives. And, you know, that's really important. But what's also important is that we don't skip over the pretext to, to Jesus' message. It's easy to just read over it, but in verse 14 it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. I think it, it's linking the inauguration of Jesus' ministry with the fact that John has now been put in prison. And, uh, you know, the Gospels often leave a lot to our imagination and we can theologise about things. But uh, why is it that Mark gives us this small detail about John being put in prison? We, we learn more about that later on in the Gospel. Well, could it be that the fact that John's been arrested has caused Jesus to come to that point where he says, you know what, enough is enough. It's time for the kingdom of God to reign. You know, Jesus is fully human. Jesus feels emotions and Jesus has this friend John who's now in prison and could it be that this was perhaps a catalyst for Jesus to start his ministry? I don't know. It's worth thinking that through. Jesus is called into action because his public ministry is going to be a demonstration of the kingdom of God, deliverance, healing, a new eschatological reality. When we say eschatology or eschatological, that theolog theological word, it means last, the last things, the last times. And it's to say that Jesus' ministry being inaugurated is also the inauguration of the last days. It's the inauguration of God bringing to a conclusion what he started to restore, reconcile and redeem humanity. That's why it's good news. That's why it's good news. And there's this sense that, you know, there's a sense of urgency in this reading. The time is now. The time has come. And we see that urgency playing out also in the call of the disciples. And through the whole narrative, there's this pattern. Repent, believe, follow. Repent, believe, follow. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. When we hear that word repent, there's, there's actually two ways we can understand it. This is written in Greek, and the Greek word for repent is repentance is metanoia. And the Greek has a connotation of changing your thinking, changing the way you see things, changing your mind, changing the way you think. St. Paul describes it in Romans 12 as the renewing of the mind. Yet, to the audience that Jesus is speaking to here, they have a different word for repent, which is, is the Hebrew word shuv, and that means to actually turn back, to return, to return to God, to turn back to God, to turn away from the thing that is captivating your life and return back to God. So, scholars will argue, what was Jesus really saying here? 
when he says to repent? Is it to change your thinking or is it to actually turn back to God? Well, perhaps it's both and it probably, we're probably splitting hairs when we think about it. Suffice to say, it's about turning away from idols and turning away from the things that offend God. But no matter how you look at it, Jesus is actually saying here, now is the time, here is the kingdom, turn around and take a hold of something that you have that is better than what you have now. Take a hold of it, do something with it. The kingdom is near, now is the time for you to see that. And I think that message is not just good for the people 2,000 years ago, I think that's a message for us as well. And as we read through the rest of the chapter and even in the following chapters, we see the breaking in of the kingdom into the, the world, the light coming in, the breaking in of the kingdom dynamic into the everyday lives of the disciples and the other crowds and everyone who follows Jesus. So this short message is foundational to the whole gospel. And all of that breaking in of the kingdom is in Christ himself. It's actually through Jesus and embodied in Jesus through healing, provision, deliverance and so forth. So in Jesus is embodying the very presence of God to the world and he's saying that God's preferred future is right here. Can we see it? Can we take a hold of it? Are we able to change our thinking and get our minds into that better place? where we can actually glimpse the things of the kingdom, but not only glimpse them, but take a hold of them for ourselves in our own lives. Repent and believe the good news. Repent, believe, follow. If we just sit with that for a minute, you know, it, it, it's got powerful connotations for our lives if we choose to obey that call, to repent, to believe, and to follow. The connotation is that the circumstance that you find yourself in that looks impossible is no longer impossible if you repent, believe and follow. If that thing that's weighing you down, that depression or that sense of hopelessness, that goes, that goes if you repent, believe and follow because it's about what happens up here. It's about what's happening in your mind. Where are you focusing things? God's calling us to renew, allow our minds to be renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's really important, you know, we could go straight into the disciple being called, but this is what they're being called into, a new way of living, a new way of seeing, a new paradigm. The good news is the breaking in of the kingdom, the very real presence of God into the world today, right now, right here for you. And don't forget what Jesus did. Nothing was impossible for him. We sang it. This is a house of miracles. We don't sing that because it's a nice song. We sing that because we see miracles. We see miracles often. So do you believe that the kingdom of heaven is near because to follow Christ is to take a hold of that belief for yourself and appropriate it in your life. I'm not asking whether you believe it in your head. I'm asking whether it has that message has had some kind of influence or effect or impact on how you understand yourself and how you see the world around you and how you relate to other people. Has that head knowledge been digested into the way you live your life? Because if it has, it means that you have responded to God's call to follow. And that is going to be a catalyst moment. So that's the first part of the reading. The second part of the reading is the calling of the first disciples, Simon, Andrew, James and John. And, and when you read the account, it gives you the impression that there must have been something pretty special about Jesus 
because it's fascinating. They all of a sudden they just get up, they leave everything behind. We're going to follow this guy, uh, Andrew and Simon. They leave their nets at once. It says at once. They leave their nets. It gives you a real sense of urgency. You know, the time has come. Right, let's go. Right? There's that sense of urgency, isn't there? And then when it comes to James and John, they're there with their father, Zebedee. They're doing the family business. They're following dad, if you like. Jesus comes along and without delay, it says, without delay, he said, come and follow. And what did they do? They left dad in the boat. And they followed. Does that make sense? So, when I first read this years and years ago, I thought I just came to the conclusion there must be something really compelling about Jesus. You know, maybe his words, the way he said it, I don't know, something, and that that caused them to just leave everything behind. Well, you know, with a bit of thought and a bit of study, most scholars actually would think that. If you read all the gospel accounts in conjunction with one another, it suggests that the disciples probably knew something about Jesus already. It wasn't the first time they had encountered Jesus. Don't forget that they were followers of John and Jesus was was with John. There was a whole lot of interactions that happened there. So whether it be through the testimony of John the Baptist or other encounters that may have happened, remember The Gospels leave us with a lot to fill in for ourselves and imagine what it might be. But I suspect that these fishermen had encountered Jesus already, that already they understood something of what it is that Jesus was going to be doing. And that's why they responded so positively. You know, at that time there was a community called the Essenes who had a growing expectation that the the end was coming and that the Messiah was about to come on the scene. And in fact, they they were right. Jesus Jesus is the chosen one. We read about that last week. And there's this growing expectation that the Messiah is about to be revealed because the world has gotten so bad that God wants to do something new. And he wants to do something new with people using just normal people like Andrew and Simon and James and John and Virginia and Elise and Paul and all of you guys. But the whole pattern for all of them and for us is repent, believe, follow. So what does it mean to follow? We've been teasing that out haven't we what does it mean to follow are you allowing the spirit of god to renew your mind are you allowing the spirit of god to sift out the old and bring in the new the things that god is doing in the here and now not in the past but now and into the future are you allowing the spirit to do that for you are you working in con in in step with the spirit paul talks about being in step with the spirit is that happening for you and when it comes to the things you place your faith in is it first and foremost in the lord jesus or is it in other things these are the things we need to be thinking about a lot of us get stuck when we think about following jesus you know we what does it mean someone during the week came to me and said i want to talk to you about vocation i you know i'm not sure what god wants me to do we all get to that point sometimes we don't know what god wants us to do and we get stuck and we say well what does it actually look like to follow jesus and uh you know you can put your hand up at an altar call and say yes lord yes god i want to follow you i'm giving my life to jesus i want to follow jesus but then comes the reality of discerning for yourself what does that mean because nobody can tell you what to do in that that's between you and the lord well i want to qualify that i think people can help us discern i think that's a a corporate thing that we do 
And when it comes to the reality, there's a sense that following for one person might be very, very different to what following looks like for another person. We're all created uniquely with, a, with our own set of giftings and our own set of experiences and a particular kind of vocation, a particular kind of purpose because of who you are as opposed to being different from who they are or who he or she is. And can I suggest to you that discerning your call, your purpose, your mission, as it were, does not have to be done by yourself. God has given all of us to each other. You belong to one another. This is a corporate body of Christ. And the discerning of our giftings and our vocation and our purpose is something that we can do. We've been given the gift, the gift of one another. We are called to follow Jesus together, not as individuals, but as a body, as a church, an, an assembly, an ecclesia. We're called to follow together. And we do that by serving one another as well. So, you know, if you're not sure where to start, why don't you go and help Terry with making pancake batter or why don't you get alongside Leanne and say, well, how can I help with English conversation? Or maybe you'd say, I'd like to do a reading in church or find somewhere to start. Join a small group. We have some beautiful small groups and we'd like to start more. Maybe you'd like to start a small group. I don't know. There's lots that you can do to begin to discern what is God calling me to do? What giftings do I have? And what giftings do other people recognise in me? And once we begin to put some flesh on those bones, we begin to see what it really looks like to follow. As we serve one another, some of you are called to serve within the church, some of you are called to serve outside of the church. But Jesus is a servant and if we're going to follow Jesus, we serve in one way, shape or form. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Maybe you could make a personal commitment to pray more. Maybe you could make a personal commitment to not only read the Bible but to digest it and understand it, to become biblically literate. Not just read the parts that make you feel good, but go to the hard things and say, well, what does this mean, Lord? What does it mean for me? The easiest thing we can do is come together in pairs or triplets and just read the Bible together and talk about it. The Holy Spirit will show up, I guarantee you. It will happen. There's plenty of ways that you can decide what your following looks like, what the next step looks like for you. But my encouragement is, don't just stand still. Don't just stand there waiting for God to do something. God is calling us, if we're going to follow, what do you have to do to follow somebody? You can't just, if, if I'm following Virginia out the door and I just stand here, I'm go, I'm, I am following. No, you're not. You're just standing still. You need to take a step. If you're going to follow, you need to take a step. And for some of you, it might be a step of faith. Take that step step and follow jesus will lead your steps if you're going in the wrong direction if you're following jesus he'll say hang on a minute get over here this is where i want you it will happen and your relationship with god will flourish and you will begin to thrive in your life if you allow god to renew your mind and turn toward him and choose to follow jesus you know i, I look at Everyone in this church, and I think I know most of you, there's some I haven't met before, some new people and some that have come recently that I don't know very well yet. But when I look at the room, there are so many people with giftings here and so many of you are using them, but there's so much smarts in the room, there's so much creativity and I, I just imagine the Holy Spirit unleashing you all on the world, right? Can you imagine what God can do. Just, just think about it. We are here 
because the time has come. The time has come to fulfilment. It wasn't just 2,000 years ago, it's been every single day ever since for the church and it continues today, it'll continue tomorrow, it'll continue right through every day this year. The time has come to proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven is here, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there is a new king, a new ruler, his name is Jesus and nothing is impossible. May it be so for you and me, amen. The Lord be with you.